Welcome. My name is Jamika Marshall, and I am very pleased to serve as the Shadow the Scientist Coordinator. Thank you all for being with us. And I'd like to extend a special welcome to the students and educators from the Lodha Genius Program at Ashoka University. Shadow the Scientist is an initiative housed under the Creating Equity and STEAM umbrella of programs offered by a team at the University of California, Santa Cruz. In this session, we have the privilege of shadowing members of the Gemini North, of the Gemini North Science Team as they perform evening observations. The International Gemini Observatory consists of twin 8.1 meter optical infrared telescopes located on Mauna Kea in Hawaii and Cerro Pachon in Chile, which are two of the best observing sites on the planet. Tonight's session is with the Gemini North Telescope, which is located on Hawaii's Mauna Kea as a part of the international community of observatories built to take advantage of the superb atmospheric conditions on this long dormant volcano, which rises about 4,200 meters into the dry, stable air of the Pacific. Both of the Gemini telescopes have been designed to excel and a wide variety of optical and infrared capabilities. By incorporating technologies such as laser guide star adaptive optics and multi-object spectroscopy, astronomers in the Gemini Partnership explore the universe in unprecedented depth and detail. With locations in both hemispheres, the International Gemini Observatory can collectively access the entire night sky. Now, I am very excited to say that we have several Gemini staff members joining us as guides during this session. So I'd like to first welcome Brian Lameau, who's an associate scientist at Gemini North to get us started. Hi, Brian, welcome. Oh. Hello, Jamika, can you hear me? <laughs> I can hear you now, yes, thank you. Wonderful, okay, how are you this evening? I'm doing well, how are you? I am very well. We are open tonight, so that's always a, always a good night on Mauna Kea when we can open the telescope. <clears throat> so as uh, Jamika mentioned, I'm a staff scientist here. I have several other colleagues um, here in the room with me. This is Emily Peavy right next to me on my right. <laughs> and then <Gra> <laughs> you have a lot of video on here. And then Garima Singh over here. <clears throat> and you'll hear from them uh, later in the session. We also have in the control room, so... We are actually in the base facility right now. So we're not on top of Mauna Kea, we're down at around sea level. Um, and uh, let's see, where is it? Okay, so the uh, HBF control room, this is right behind us here, uh, just down the hallway. This is where they're controlling the telescope. Um, so I think Jimmy is about to put up a pin. Um, we have uh, two scientists here controlling the telescope. On the right there is uh, Mark Rawlings, so he's our observer for the night. Hey, Mark. Hey, folks. And on the left uh, is Denise Hung, um, who is our operator for the night, and we can talk about what those those roles mean. Um, but we always have uh, two people that are um, uh, observing on a, on a given night. So we have a huge number of staff here uh, in, in Hilo, about, about 80 total, something like that. Um, and uh, people have a lot of different roles, um, uh, from getting the telescope ready during the day to doing uh, outreach with the community and telling about all the science that we do here, to getting observations prepared during the day, to planning the observations. Uh, Grima is an expert in, in engineering and in adaptive optics, which is one of the capabilities of our telescope. Um, uh, and then we have observers um, that uh, take the data at nighttime. 
And so we all kind of shift in these roles. We're all adept at different, uh, di uh, different chairs. So for example, I am in the chair that Mark is in sometimes, um, and Mark would be in my chair. <laughs> um, and uh, Denise is actually trained for both the roles in there. Um, so could, Denise could be in either chair. Um, and so just to give a little bit of context, we're uh, here in Hilo. So let me share my screen. Okay, so we're on the big island of Hawaii. That's here, that's out in the middle of the Pacific. See, there's nothing around. A lot of water. <laughs> um, we're here in Hilo on the east side, on the, the east coast. Uh, Mauna Kea, where we're doing our observations this evening, is about uh, 40 kilometers away here. And as Jamika mentioned, it's about 4,000 meters. So very high up, it's about 60% of the, the total oxygen uh, that we have dear, down here at sea level. So. It's really a blessing to be able to observe down at, at uh, sea level. It's not cold. Uh, we have coffee. Uh, we can breathe oxygen. <laughs> All the fun things that you know humans like to do. Um, and um, so we remotely control the telescopes. But in the control room, uh, both Denise and Mark have eyes. So you can see there's just an incredible number of monitors there. Um, we have TV monitors. Uh, each workstation has eight monitors. To the left of Denise is a bunch of cameras that are uh, taking real-time video of various aspects of the telescope. And so we can monitor with very high precision uh, all of the instruments and weather conditions and, and all the components of the telescope that we need to monitor at nighttime. Um, so the sun just set um, probably, let's see. Uh, well, it's almost been two hours, I guess. Uh, we don't normally start observing uh, until about an hour after sunset. We start to kind of get ready, um, but in order for it to be dark enough, it, it takes about an hour after sunset. So we're kind of just at the beginning of our observations uh, this evening. Um, and let's see, so here's a, a live view of what it looks like on the summit of Mauna Kea right now. This is from the, the Keck telescopes. So these are very close to us on Mauna Kea. So they're on the northern plateau of Mauna Kea. So Gemini Telescope, if you can see my cursor, see my cursor, uh, is right here. So we're on the, the eastern plateau. So uh, Gemini is here. The Canada France Hawaii Telescope is here. The University of Hawaii Telescope. Uh, you see my cursor? Not well. Not well. Oh, okay. Um, over on the right, anyways, is, is uh, uh, Canada France Hawaii Telescope, Gemini in the middle. And then the University of Hawaii telescope, uh, the third one from the top, uh, and then the United Kingdom infrared telescope. Up here on the northern plateau is uh, is the two Keck telescopes and the Subaru telescope. Um, and so this is a picture of um, the sky taken from in between the two Keck uh, domes on the left hand side, and then looking north. Uh, looking west and then looking east towards uh, our observatory. So you can see Gemini right here. And so you can see that it's a very, very nice night. Um, we can see stars. We can see the Milky Way uh, running overhead. Um, these are very, very uh, light sensitive cameras. So it's not actually that bright up there. If you went up there uh, besides the moon, it would be very, very hard to see. I've observed from the summit many times and uh, it's hard to breathe, hard to see. <laughs> Those two things are correlated, by the way. <laughs> um, and uh, but right now, uh, as I said, we're you know maybe hour and a half, two hours after sunset. So there's maybe a little bit of residual light from the sun, uh, probably not, but we also have the moon coming up. The moon is almost full. I don't know if it's- Just passed. Just passed full, <laughs> just yeah. Just <passed> full. <laughs> so it's, it's very bright and on a cloudless <laughs> night, um, uh, that, that makes for a very different sky than on a night where the moon is in a new phase. So um, we're actually going to be using mostly, um, in, so we have a variety of different instruments on the on the telescope, and I can show you what that means. Let's see if me. Sad. <laughs> yeah, we'll come back to that. OK. So um, you're going to have to kind of imagine this, but <clears throat> this is a 1980s rendering of our of our telescope here. Um, so 
light comes from the universe here, and it's white light because it's uh, comprised of all all colors. So uh, white light comes in from the from the universe, and it bounces off. This is our primary mirror here, and then our secondary mirror. It's piped to our secondary mirror, and then that goes down into uh, what we call the cast cage or instrument cage. And so we have a big telescope. It's eight point one meters. Is the is the diameter of the primary mirror. Um, so this this you'll just have to imagine is eight point one meters, um, and you uh, reflect all of that light that that big old mirror collects, um, and then um, you decide what to do with it. So you have a bunch of light, uh, optical and uh, redder than optical near infrared light. Um, and you decide, okay, which of these uh, sets of instruments that we have down here in our instrument cage do we want to use? And so uh, uh, Mark tonight has a, a set of observations that use a variety of different instruments. In fact, it probably, do we have any GMOS observations potentially in the queue tonight, Mark? Yeah, yeah there's GMOS a bit later on, yeah. Okay, so... Mostly, mostly we're next, but we've got one GMOS, I think. Okay, and right now we're using Geniers? Yep. Okay, so yeah, so GMOS is our is our main optical uh, instrument. It's a very powerful instrument. It can take images, it can disperse light to make a spectrum, to make a rainbow. Um, and that's uh, very powerful for other, uh, other reasons. Um, you can uh, take, um, a, a, get a rainbow for a single object in the sky, or you can get a rainbow for uh, many, many objects in the sky. So this is a, what's called a multi-object spectrograph. Um, and so this is a, a very powerful instrument that we use uh, most of the time when the moon is in a kind of new phase or the moon isn't so bright. So when the moon is, is very bright like it is tonight, it, it kind of uh, blinds us, our ability to see in the optical. Um, it's uh, the contrast uh, becomes much harder. Um, so you need to uh, stare for a longer time uh, to be able to pick out very faint galaxies or comets or asteroids or whatever you're looking for. Um, and so instead of trying to uh, push really hard in the optical, the moon is not as pernicious, not as uh, doesn't create as much light or the differential between the, the uh, light, the kind of background light uh, when there is a moon versus when there isn't a moon in the sky in the near infrared is is less so it doesn't affect observations in the near infrared as much um, and so instead of trying to use an optical instrument we generally try to use an ir instrument and so that's what we're using right now it's the um you can see the light coming down in here and we have a, a tertiary mirror uh, called a science fold um, and the light bounces off of this so we can change the tilt uh, the tip and tilt of this of this mirror uh, the light bounces off of here and it gets piped into this little tiny hole in this very, very big instrument called Geniers. Um, so just to give an idea, it's I think roughly a five ton instrument mounted on the back of a 230 ton telescope structure, which is housed inside a 400 ton dome. <laughs> <laughs> and we have to get this, all this light that we've collected uh, from 8.1 meters all focused down to like millimeter or micron precision. So we're dealing with these really, really big numbers, really, really big pieces of equipment, and we have to have precision, engineering precision to like the micron uh, level. And so we pipe it into this, uh, this instrument. Um, and then uh, I think, Mark, which type of observation is this? Is this a long slit observation? Um... Uh, the, the... Sorry. Uh, it looked like the um the slit was pretty long in the GAC, so uh probably yeah. wasn't crossed. Through. That's right. Yeah. 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 Okay. So yeah. So this is just we take a, a slit and we and we put it in an object and we can talk about what that object uh is later and why we might be pointing at that particular object. Um, but we put a, a slit on that object, so we only get the light of that object, and then we send that through a prism, and we disperse the light, make a rainbow in the infrared. So it's not one, not a rainbow that we can see, not super pretty, um, but infrared rainbow, still super cool. <laughs> uh, and um, and then we put that onto a detector, so just basically taking an image, and we get emission from that source, and then the scientists get that uh, data 
the people that ask for it, uh, and then they do science with it. And so what does Genius stand for and what is it best used for? Okay, great question, Emily. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so we have a lot of G's in our names. Yes. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> so why anything that you hear G's? without a G is usually a visiting instrument. So, uh, for example, Mark just mentioned Maroon X. We are going to make it a, a, an instrument that we uh, own at some point, but it's right now it's being uh, loaned to us from University of Chicago. So there's a team at University of Chicago that works in collaboration with Gemini. Um, and so it's part of what we call a visiting instrument program. Mm -hmm. And so as soon as, uh, as soon as we get that, uh, as part of our facility suite of instruments, it'll be Gamaroon X. <laughs> Gamaroon. <laughs> for, for now, it's just Maroon X. So, um, so GMOS, GNEARS, GCAL, GPOL, you see all these on the screen. So, uh, unsurprisingly, the G stands for Gemini, not grumpy. Uh, and then it's near infrared, uh, and then and the S is spectrograph. So this is the um, uh, name for the type of instrument that disperses white light into a rainbow uh, to get the spectrum of an object. So this is basically the amount of energy emitted by an object at different wavelengths. So in, in the infrared, let's let's take an example in the optical. So um, if you looked at a rainbow. Uh, it may be more intense on the blue side versus the red side or vice versa. Um, and so you could tell something, if you were trained in it, you could tell something about the pattern of the raindrops and the uh, um, angle at which the sun was being shined on those raindrops. Uh, you could tell something about that based on the amount of brightness in the blue versus the amount of brightness in the red. And so same thing with galaxies uh, uh, or or any object right now, I think we're looking at a star, um, that the amount of blue light versus the amount of red light can tell you something about the energetics of that object. So uh, where it's emitting, for what reason it's emitting, uh, uh, what uh, elements are present in that object, uh, what um, type of um, kinematics, so how that uh, object is moving, um, so on and so forth. There's all sorts of wonderful information. And so um, Genius is actually not only a spectrograph, it's an imager, and it's also uh, what's called an integral field unit, which is basically you take a picture of the sky, but at every location in the sky, you get a rainbow. So it's basically the best of both worlds. You get, a, you get an image, uh, but you get a full color image uh, in the infrared. And so that, um, that is something that we just uh, developed for Genius. It's only been available in the last couple of months, but it's a very, very powerful capability. Yeah, Jamika. Okay, so we have a few questions in the chat. I wasn't sure if you saw them, so I thought I'd just raise my hand and bring um, your attention to them. Um, I answered one of them. Emily has expertly answered another one. Um, but we have one here about uh, chop nod. What is chop and nod, Brian? So um, nodding I'm more familiar with. Chopping is, um, is a complex technique that we actually don't do uh, at, at Gemini, although we may do it in the future. So I'm going to focus on the nod part of that question. Um, I don't know, Garima, have you, have you done chopping before? Okay. So, um, nodding is something that is done mostly for infrared observations. Um, but it can be done for optical observations as well. The idea is that your, so your galaxy or whatever you're looking at, is extremely faint compared to the background. And that's true in the optical and in the infrared. But the, the contrast uh, is uh, much worse in the infrared because the sky is bright in the infrared. So if you look in the, if you're on a moonless night and you look in the blue, the sky isn't actually that bright. So the atmosphere doesn't get in the way that, that much. Um, and that's just due to the elemental composition of the atmosphere and a variety of refractive properties of the atmosphere. Um, if you look in the very far infrared, at least from the one that we can see from the ground, um, it's full of uh, just emission from uh, water and oxygen and OH and all these things. And, uh, and 
light from uh, a star or a galaxy that you're looking at is also absorbed by the atmosphere. So you have this like kind of double problem of uh, the atmosphere is emitting plus it's absorbing light from outer space. And so that makes the contrast uh, uh, difficult. <laughs> and so we don't have these problems when you go to like the James Webb Space Telescope where you have to deal with other background light, like the zodiacal background light, uh, which just comes from our, our solar system uh, or, from the, or from the Milky Way itself. Um, but uh, you don't have to deal with the atmosphere. And so when we're on the ground, we have to deal with the atmosphere. And so one way of getting around this, it's not really it's dealing with the fact that you have this you know, faint object on this very bright background, is that you move the telescope to different positions so that the object shows up in uh, at different locations on your detector and so then you just subtract those two frames and you end up with so you take an image of the object here an image of the object here you subtract the two and then you kind of shift them and add them together and so then you're able to remove the background if you take an uh, observation on a time scale where the background doesn't change too much which is usually two to three minutes for the infrared sky um and uh, you're able to pop out the source and so actually the thing that i showed at the very beginning uh, let me see if I can switch to it. Hey, Mark, do you have like an act sequence that you could uh, put up, like maybe with the the sky, if if I'm not bothering you? Um, mm, mm. like when you did the GAC? Yeah. Uh, I can do. Is that helpful? <laughs> uh, kind of. So did it uh, did it subtract off the sky? Doesn't look like uh, it. it looks no, like there's no separate sky frame for this one. It was a bright source. Ah, okay. Okay, I see. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then you moved it yeah. after this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could you could you do like um uh like the next image like a like a GAC the next image and then sky equals the the previous act image. Uh, I promise uh, this will be cool. We can get it. Seven. I need to do like sky equals uh, six. Six or something, yeah. Let's try that. Uh, sure. There you go. Yeah, perfect. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. So this is the basic idea. So you basically remove the background. You've really brightened up the source. So you can see the negative part of the source from the previous image, and you can see the positive part of the source from this image. Um, so everything's just shifted down into the uh, down into the left, and um, so this is the way that we get around uh, like removing uh, the sky to some level. We're still left with a lot of noise associated with the sky, so that makes it it's still very challenging to observe in the infrared. And the further red you go, the harder that is. Um, but this is the basic idea. And so when you have a when you have a slit observation, you actually move the slit back and forth like this so that you can subtract off the um, uh, the two images we call it ABBA or like an AB sequence. Um, and this is basically the only way to do that science in, in the infrared. You can't just keep staring at the same uh, place. And so a, not, a, a chop, I'll just briefly say what my basic knowledge of chopping is, <laughs> um, is a mirror moving back and forth like this. So it's, um, it's moving on source and then off source, on source, off source. So it's basically the same thing. You're getting the thermal background in the enclosure so, so the so telescope, even though you know it's fairly cool up on Mauna Kea, it's still, let's say, 273 Kelvin. So it you know it's still it's not a cryogenic environment up there. Luckily for us, if we have to observe at the summit, um, and so the telescope structure itself, the insides of of geniers or whatever instrument you're using, um, uh, the mirror, they all have thermal energy that you see in the infrared, and so. Uh, by chopping, you can basically remove that um, excess uh, 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 noise that's coming from the telescope structure, more or less. Does that sound reasonable? Yeah, you normally do it with a secondary mirror. Um, historically, there was an interesting approach where the, some telescopes use a chopper wheel, which is a wheel with like every, uh, because you do it on a periodic basis, you have a wheel with an equal number of holes in it. You spin the wheel. Then it uh, and it it deflects and then doesn't deflect and deflects and doesn't deflect the beam. So you can alternate between two positions automatically just by spinning a wheel. So some telescopes do it that way. 
But with us, it, with, with us, it would be the secondary mirror that we oscillate. You do it in a square wave pattern. Yeah, I was silly. Mark is like an expert at this. I, I don't know why I didn't ask Mark. <laughs> fine, fine. Uh, yes. So, so that's in, in in a nutshell. That's how that's that's the difference between chopping. Where nodding basically in, in nodding the telescope and chopping, you're just oscillating the mirror to bounce to another position, and you do it in a square wave pattern, so you get equal coverage on both. So to give you a and rapid. In the chat uh, relating to what we're talking about says, does anyone still use the wheel method? Ooh, Mark. um, that's that. I don't. I don't know if anyone does on the bigger telescopes. Um, normally, we, we've got such good control systems for the secondaries nowadays that if you're going to chop, you can usually just do it automatically with the mirror. But historically, it was a, it was kind of a simple mechanical way to do it, and it's kind of a nice visual picture because you can imagine this thing that's like a mirror with holes in it. And you spin it, and so you get a, get a deflection or not. So that's that's how I always remember it. But yeah, most people just actually oscillate the secondary now. And do you know why we don't do it at, at Gemini? Is it our secondary is just not adept enough? Uh, I, I don't know, uh, actually. Um... Because I know they're they're working very hard on an adaptive secondary, and I thought that like chopping would be a part of that, but maybe I'm misremembering. Yeah, well, it depends on the, the contrast as well. So if you're... Uh... Um, if you're looking at like, you know, so, some mid infrared systems tend to do, we tend to use shorter wavelength ranges as well. Um, and also if you're doing high resolution work, then um, the contrast's high enough that you don't really need to do it. It doesn't get you enough to, to merit the effort. You lose time on the source. So. Yeah, right. Yeah. But if we took more mid infrared-ish uh, observations, so if we took like L and M band with Gnares, uh let's say we get the short red camera back for example yeah uh, or, or we used to have a 10 micron instrument called michelle um you know maybe it would be useful for that but <laughs> yeah i would imagine before I was red. Red. yeah yeah uh, i didn't know it went that red that's amazing yeah okay well hopefully that more or less answered the question um we have a lot of questions coming in the chat it's great so that yeah, we have thank enough you people guys. Yes, monitoring it yes. um a Super couple awesome. that uh we haven't gotten to or at least i'm not able to answer we had uh what is the instra origin arctic and instra offset arctic what do they do and that might have been on the previous screen that you okay were on. let me bring that one up yeah <laughs> okay okay we even have the chop throw. <laughs> so, yeah, we were chopping at one time. Um, uh, where is this? Oh, uh, I think arc um arc sec got yeah. um uh, auto corrected to Arctic. <laughs> okay, all right. That's a that's a great uh that's a great question. So um uh yeah, so this is this is um you can imagine. So I was talking about the light piping into the instruments. Um, and this kind of like micron precision that we need. Um, we actually work during the day to check this instrument origin. So basically we have light that comes in um, from different sources. It can come, it all comes from the, the primary mirror and the secondary mirror, but there's a bunch of optics. Uh, so if we're using adaptive optics, which we'll talk about later, uh, for example, um, that light can come in a little bit differently than uh, 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 just coming straight from the the, the primary mirror to the secondary mirror to the tertiary. Um, and also we have different ports. So each, each one of these is a instrument port. We have uh, five total ports. And so based on the port that an instrument is in, and we kind of switch out ports pretty frequently, um, uh, there can be a slight offset about uh, uh, for how the light comes into the instrument. And so uh, sometimes, and like, so in this case, we're observing with genius and we're observing just uh, normal sky, so not with adaptive optics. Um, and so there's the, this uh, instrument origin that's built in that we have to move the telescope just a little bit. Uh, this is in arc seconds. So this is uh, 1 36th hundredth of a fingernail held at arm's length. So very, very small distance on the sky. Um, and so we have to offset the telescope three arc seconds, roughly in one 
uh, direction and 23 and a half arc seconds in the other direction. So that the light comes directly into Genius using this mode. If we were using adaptive optics, uh, then we actually have a different instrument origin because of the way the light comes in from that mirror. Um, and then on top of that, we have a we have a uh, um, offset instrument offset. Sorry, uh, instrument off. No, no, oh, no. <laughs> don't, okay. don't apologize to me, Mark. No, no, mm -hmm. I was stopping to give you room. Um, uh, we have an instrument offset, which uh, probably was just cleared when, uh, so we're actually moving right now. Um, uh, so that was just cleared. Uh, we point the telescope, Denise points, the, so Mark asked Denise to point to a particular location. Denise says, yes, I'd be glad to Mark. And so <laughs> then we move and uh, we get really, really close because Denise is awesome at pointing, Gemini too, but mostly Denise. Uh, and um, uh, there's a little bit of tiny offset. So actually, once we get to the location, uh, uh, Mark will take a picture. Um, is it okay if I bring? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're definitely slewing right now. Um, and uh, Mark will take a picture, and it'll be offset. Uh, the tar he'll identify the target. Like, oh yeah, that's the one that we want to look at. And we have to do a little tiny tweak. So it's usually a couple of arc seconds. Uh, to move directly to put the uh, science fiber or the slit or whatever we're, we're using directly on that source. And so we have to do, that's what that little instrument offset is. And we keep those values so that we know where we are relative to where we pointed. So yeah, as, um, as Emily mentioned, we're actually moving right now. This is a picture of the dome. This is where the telescope is, is pointing. So we're almost pointing straight up. Um, that's maybe hard to visualize, but in, this is the like a bird's eye view of our dome. And telescope is pointing straight up out of the top. This black part is the the shutter. And um, I think Denise said we're just we're now in location. So I'm going to switch over actually to the Maroon X. Yeah. So this is what we're doing right now. So, um, so we're not doing. Right no, we we got to do the uh, standard first. Standard. So we oh, still sorry. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We'll Maroon X after this one. All right, so we actually get to see an acquisition sequence here. So maybe we'll pause on the questions. Um, let's see. Well, even with the acquisition, we do have a question of what is the target? Yeah, yeah, great, great question. So um, we don't always know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I observe on a lot of different telescopes and I observe targets that I'm interested in, um, but we get um, a, a requests from all over the world um, to observe different targets for scientists that are interested in like, hey, I'm interested in this particular star or this particular galaxy or this set of galaxies or this black hole at the edge of the universe or uh, this asteroid. And, uh, and then we have a process to uh, determine which of those scientific ideas are the, are the best ones. And then this goes into our pool of potential observations. Um, and so then those are scheduled. And um, the observation that we're taking right now uh, I actually do know because it's a staff scientist here at Gemini under Nicolas Chenet. It's his program. And he looks at very, very massive stars and he looks at the outflowing gas that's around these uh, massive stars that, that are at the end of their lives. So they're called Wolf Ray stars. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, they're super cool. Um, and so they're basically in the death throes uh, of, their, of their lifetime. And so they're shedding off a bunch of gas and dust and all sorts of things. And so um, uh, we were just looking at one of these types of stars. And when we take an observation with uh, Genius, actually uh, going back to something I said earlier, which is that the atmosphere absorbs um, some of the light, we actually don't know a priori. So at the beginning of the observation, we don't know how much of the uh, light from the astronomical object is going to be absorbed. It depends on where you're pointing on the sky. It depends on the temperature of the atmosphere, uh, the particular chemical composition of, 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 of that part of the sky that you're looking at at that given time. Um, so it can vary a lot. And so we have to take a calibrator. And that's, uh, I think, what um, Mark and Denise are doing right now. So uh, probably in a, in, a, in a second, we're going to see a um, image of a calibrator star. And so this is a star with a known um, uh, emission at every single wavelength uh, that we're observing at. So we know this star really well. We know what it should look like. 
we then take an observation of it and we say, ah, okay, there's some uh, brightness missing here, there's some brightness missing here, there's some brightness missing here. And then our assumption is we can apply that same uh, difference or quotient. Uh, so the, the division of the template of that star or the true knowledge That's of that cool. star. And what we actually observe, we can apply that to the scientific target, which has an unknown uh, emission profile as a function of wave. Jamika? Yes. Um, could you speak to why we can't talk specifically about exactly what's being observed um, and you know have a discussion about proprietary data and maybe how long things are um, proprietary for and why it's important that we are very general when we talk about uh, what we're looking at here? Sure, yeah. So um, so we'll just go through uh, really quickly. I'll, I'll uh, talk about what uh, Mark is doing. So, um, so he just took an image and uh, you can kind of see the image in the in the background here. It's it's a bit hard to see, but um, awesome. it, where the the main target is is here on the uh, on this screen, and where the target is supposed to be is this crosshair right now. And so this is this little fine uh, fine adjustment that um, uh, we're going to make uh, now that we've you know made this big move over to uh, uh, this uh, standard star. Um, so. Uh, Mark just asked Denise to tweak the telescope movement just a little bit. Um, and then uh, hopefully, exactly right on. So dead on, uh, the movement was good. Uh, it looks like we're in the right location. And so then we're gonna take one more uh, image just to be sure. We're gonna put the slit in, which is what we need to block out all the other light, but the starlight. Um, and then as long as uh, that looks good, so we can, see the star, the calibrator star through the slit, uh, then we'll move on to taking a spectrum of it. So that's that's the basic sequence that Mark's doing right now. Um, so yeah, proprietary data, um, it's typical at Gemini um, if for data to be released to the public 12 months after it's uh, observed. So, um, so people from all over the world apply and they get basically a 12 month period to do the science that they want to do with the observations that they're that they take and then that's given back to the public um, to do whatever they would like so a lot of times we take observations with very specific science questions in mind um, i want to know exactly the amount of hydrogen that's outflowing out hydrogen gas that's outflowing from this star and so you take a spectrum and you make your measurement and you say Ooh, cool i measured it there it is it's moving at a thousand kilometers per second uh, it's this much amount of hydrogen gas. Uh, I'm going to publish a paper and I'm going to tell everybody about it. So, hey, guys, you never believe what I found in the star. A thousand kilometers per second, bunch of gas going out. And everyone's like, oh, cool. That's great. What else happened to that star? And you're like, yeah, I don't know. I'm looking at another star. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so there's plenty of scientists that say, well, actually, I'm interested in uh, the level of activity of that star um, in relation to how much it's rotating differentially. And they can go back and they can take that same data and they can make a measurement and after the 12 month period is end, ended. Um, and uh, they can say, aha, okay, it's doing this and this and this and this. Uh, and so I'm gonna publish paper, I'm gonna tell everybody about it. And so that's a really awesome model and it's a lot of observatories do this. They have really great uh, archives. Um, and maybe Jamika, you can put the archive um, link in the, in the chat. Um, but we have this awesome archive that you can basically uh, query anything you want. So any any observations that have take, been taken more than 12 months ago, um, uh, you can look up, you can take the data, and you can do effectively whatever you'd like with it. Um, some uh, teams decide to waive that proprietary period. So people say, no, I don't. I want to give it to the public immediately. Um, that That is obligatory for some observations and some telescopes. Um, but um, generally, there's a there's a, at least a six month proprietary period before it's released to the public. And the idea, and it's controversial, I would say, but the idea is that, you know, you spend a lot of time, we have to write telescope proposals, it takes a long time uh, to, to write those to do all the work associated with them, to to get the data to prepare the data, prepare the observations, 
uh, then, you know, get lucky, weather's good, you get the data, you reduce the data, you, you know, do all the analysis, and then you publish a paper with it. If, <clears throat> if somebody just grabs a uh, <laughs> data that you've just taken, and they're just waiting and, uh, uh, and you know, they don't have all that other work to do, uh, perhaps they publish your scientific results before you're able to do that. And so it's just allowing the people to, that uh, propose for it to catch their breath um, and, then, uh, and then move on. So I'm I'm highlighting all of these wonderful questions with a white question mark so it's easier for you all to see where the questions are and um uh, and and respond. Um I don't want to to skip any of them. So that's um primarily what I'm doing right now. Thank you all for the wonderful questions. Please keep them coming and we'll do our best to get to them. Emily's answering questions, Garima, Brian. Um, Mark, Denise, I've answered a few, so uh, keep them coming. We will try to cover them all. Um, and one one question that I, I that I just saw that uh, could uh, that that just kind of continues what you've been talking about um, is the coding on the telescope. Uh, is that done on site? Uh, yeah, the co the coding is done uh, on Mauna Kea. We have a coding chamber up there. I'm just showing it off uh, a couple of days ago to um, a new staff member. Um, big old coding chamber. It's bigger than 8.1 meters across. Um, and we use uh, protected silver at Gemini. Uh, so there's two different types of coding that generally that telescopes use around the world. It's uh, aluminum and... <laughs> and uh, protected silver. We, we get that a lot, so it may not be bad. <laughs> I, I'm not used to it still. So... <laughs> Usually more than one is bad. One is mm -hmm. typically kind of okay. Uh, especially with juniors, this happens a decent amount. Maybe it's an acne or a thing. I just heard the success sound, so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> was that a juniors thing, Mark? Uh... No, it was a long slew, like, thing that pops up. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. So you guys are slewing to a maroon X target right now? Yeah. It's on the other side of the sky. Okay. I'll just put up that screen. Right? Yeah. Uh, there was a question on the um, astro data. So I was thinking if you can, like, Google just image of the ISS, you know, just the. Uh, sure. I, I just want to, like, save Yeah. Data. Just like the. Uh, like an image where we can see the instrument instrument support structure. Uh, I can also stop sharing if you you want to look for a picture and then no, I can stop sharing. That's okay. I mean, you, I, I'm I'm seeing your uh, screen, so it's so just like any image uh, from a telescope. Um. So I'll just mention. So we use uh, protected silver here, uh, because it's uh it's better for wavelengths longer than about. 460 nanometers. So um, we are infrared optimized as a telescope and um, uh, silver is the best uh, best choice there. So we recoat uh, fairly often um, uh, and then we have to clean the, 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 the mirror with corrosive elements uh, uh, also fairly yeah, often. Yeah. So that's why we have to, that's why we have to uh, recoat a lot. Uh, Ryan, let me use the, uh, let me share the screen. Yeah, sounds good. And here, this is called the instrument support structure. And all of these instruments are basically mounted to the instrument support structure, which is also called ISS. And so this whole thing basically rotates. So this is the cast rotator uh, wrap that, you know, when we are basically uh, following the target, we need to also compensate for the sky rotation so that everything basically rotates. So the, the science fold that Brian was talking about is actually 
uh, is inside. This is just another view of the ISS. So the science folder is basically inside the, uh, the structure here. You can see the uh, basically underneath it. Sorry, inside the structure, and all of these instruments are well, all of these objects that you see are different instruments mounted at different ports. Even like we have, um, we can even mount a telescope. Sorry, we can even mount an instrument at the the bottom port as well. So the it's called the up looking port. So, so everything basically rotates. Um, so I hope that is a bit more clear. It's really apropos actually, because we just moved to the bottom port. Okay. And so that the one exception of, of this, uh, having to move the cast rotator for your observation is when you're at the bottom, the bottom looking yeah. port, right? Yeah. And so actually, um, so we moved to Maroon X, which is the bottom port instrument right now. It's a fiber connected to the bottom port. I think you've seen it. Um, and. So and so Mark would usually tell uh, Denise, like, oh, I'm taking, this is a Maroon X observation. Usually Denise would know it already anyways. Um, yeah. So take the cast rotator out of follow. I think I'm going to start. 2026. So this is an 1800 second observation. So I get to breathe a little bit now. <laughs> nice, Mark. Yeah, Murnex is spiffy. It's a it's an instrument that um, allows us. Yeah, it's it does a lot of heavy lifting for us. So uh, so the, the uh, observer and operator don't have to do a whole lot during an observation if it goes well. Sorry if I jinxed you, Mark. Um, so yeah, actually, let me let's see. Well, there's an exoplanet related question. Yeah, oh, that's sorry. <laughs> that's Grima for sure. So, so just while um, we're uh, waiting to go over that, so this is uh, this is where we're piping the light right now. It's down to this uh, visitor port right here, uh, port one, um, and so that's coming into a, a fiber, which is actually dropping uh, five stories in the Gemini structure um, uh, down to the basement where we have a instrument called Maroon X, which is a, a high precision spectrograph. Its resolution is roughly 20 times better. Yeah, roughly 20 times better than Genius. Um, and so it, measurements can be made uh, of movement of objects that are you know, many, many light years away of up to a, a meter per second. So just little tiny, tiny movements of a star. Um, and this is to find uh, exoplanets, so planets that are around other stars besides our sun, um, and also to measure the atmospheres of those planets um, and uh, the chemical compositions. Um, so what was the question about exoplanets? Oh. Uh, right again. Um... In what ways can Gemini enhance its sensitivity to faint objects like dim exoplanets in crowded fields? Hmm. Again, sorry. Oh, uh, on my in my feed, it's the second to last one. Can Gemini enhance its sensitivity to faint objects? Oh, that's my question. Okay. Yeah, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I don't want to draw on the spot. Which, like, which way is Garima? Made. <laughs> that was tailor made for Garima. <laughs> yeah. Um, in crowded fields. All right. So, Gemini, basically, we're going to receive an instrument called Gemini Planet Manager 2, and it's going to come next year uh, to Gemini North, and it will basically take direct images of exoplanets. So, the Maroon X. Well, it's a radial velocity. Find the exoplanets uh, with the radial velocity method. So you don't really see the planet, but you basically see the influence of a planet around its star. Um, so um, Maroon X, I think it can do the uh, what the radial velocity of one second. Yeah, at least that. 
uh, but the Gemini planet imager instrument that I'm talking about is. Imagine talking just a little bit more about the radial velocity. Like, why why would a star for why would you want to measure the radial velocity? Sure. Um, I don't know all the ins and outs of radial velocity, but basically, um, it's all based on the Doppler effect. So if you have like two bodies kind of like, uh, you know, rotating around each other, they would exert. Um, um, sorry, so if you if you have a if a companion, let's say around the star, it would actually make the star wobble. And you can actually measure the wobbliness of that star. Um, so by basically measuring the spectra. So if the star is basically moving away from us, then it's um, red shifted. And if it's moving towards us, then it's blue shifted. So you can actually measure that uh, Doppler effect uh, via a well, that's a radial velocity that you can measure. And is one per second is the uh, accuracy, or is it what the desired accuracy? Of the precision, yeah, yeah. So it can measure shifts of up to uh, to as low as one meter per second. So even just tiny movements of the host star, it can measure. And I think like actually this particular program that we're looking at now, just generally speaking, there's a lot of Moon X observations that they take, like a a, a thirty minute observation tonight and then uh i guess mark this is your last night of your shift but the observer tomorrow night will take yeah i've got one night. yeah oh okay do you okay okay so tomorrow night probably uh mark will swoop right back to the same location with denise and they'll take another observation so the it's basically a monitoring project of a star uh because these are on really long time i mean think like a planet's moving okay the, the fast planets move in a day around their host star but Earth moves. Last I checked, about it takes about a year to go around the sun, um, and so that's you know that's a while, and so you have to monitor. Uh, so you have to monitor over long periods of time to see these little tiny changes in, in radial velocity. So coming back to the question, like so what are we doing, or what Gemini is doing to enhance the sensitivity? So it depends on what kind of techniques you're using to find that. So mm -hmm. next is a radial velocity uh, instrument. So. Uh, I don't know exactly like what kind of improvements you can do in the spectrograph to basically be more sensitive to finding like going below one meter second. I'm not really sure about that. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of improvements. I'm not. It's not my area of expertise. But like for example, uh, we had a program that we were monitoring uh, uh, binary star systems, so planets around binary stars, and so they actually changed the software to uh, do guiding on a smaller aperture. So that we could follow one of the two components of the system because the, the the previous software was getting confused by the two different stars. And so even just with the same instrument, taking like just making smart software changes can actually make a huge difference for crowded fields as so where there's binary or trinary systems. Um, well, that's what yeah. the and in that question. Because for me, Could like be. for direct imaging, I mean I don't worry about crowded field, I just I'm just focused on one star. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. So. All right, so that's it. Um, so, so anyway, so I was also saying that, um, so if you talk about direct imaging of exoplanets, then this instrument that we're going to get, it's, uh, we're going to receive an instrument called Gemini Planet Imager 2, and it's a direct imaging instrument, and you basically take direct images of exoplanets. And um, there, it's not a matter of like crowded field, it's a matter of how you can actually find, uh, you know, a faint, um, you know, exoplanet around a very like overwhelming bright star, it's because exoplanets are thousand to ten to a billion times fainter than a uh, star. So that's like we have like a, a um, it's gonna be a long talk, but we have like several technology that we are improving to be able to basically. Uh, you know, block the light of the central star so that we can see the light uh, from the faint planet. But that's all about direct imaging effects of that. So it really depends on what thing you're talking about. So, I mean, Brunex... Direct direct uh, detection is not used blindly too much, right? Like, I mean, you would do you, do you just go to like a random star and then take an observation so and see. 
so when we so in the beginning Yeah. Oh wait, um, we actually can't hear Garima. Can't hear you very well. Could you say that again? Let me let's mute that and unmute the computer that way. Uh, or maybe I'll try to speak louder. Yeah, it might be the laptop that's blocking the. Is it better? That's definitely better. Thank you so much. Um, I was just saying that in the so we 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 it. it the way we choose target for direct imaging depends on how, uh, like what's the, how good is the adaptive optics correction. So we tend to basically uh, look at bright targets because that's where we get um, the sharpest, like sharper images of, of, of a star. And then we block the light of the star. So it's not like a blind, blind search. It, it really depends on, um, uh, we look at, uh, the young stars, young bright stars, basically, uh, because um, the AO correction is good. Uh, but also we rely on the discoveries by radial velocity. If we can, if there is like a radial velocity uh, discovery of, you know, a, a giant planet lying far away from its star, then we can basically, you know, turn our, our telescope and instrument to that target and then take a direct image of that planet. So it's not necessarily a blind search. Or just move to like, you know, if there's a star forming region where we know that, you know, stars are currently forming. So there, there's like a lot of activity going on. Uh, there's a lot of circumstellar material around the star. So, you know, we may even find protoplanets. So that's like, if you, we can choose a star forming region and then do a blind search. Could we find or maybe confirm if an observe if a planet was habitable with Gemini? Great question. Um, again, it depends on the technique that you are working with. So, with the direct imaging, where you're taking the direct images of exoplanets, it is not currently possible to find planets in the habitable zone of the stars because uh, those planets lie very close to their star, but depend on what kind of stars you're observing. If you're like, it's an M dwarf star, then the habitable zone would be much closer. If it's um, you know a sun-like star, then the habitable zone would be a little bit further away. So currently with the current state of the art technology with direct imaging, we cannot um, take images of planets in the habitable zone. So we have to turn towards radial velocity methods and transit methods. So we have been like, for example, with the Kepler Space Telescope, we've been finding planets in the habitable zone. But Gemini using direct imaging wouldn't be able to. But with radial velocity, with Maronex, yes, mm -hmm. that's the goal basically to find Earth-like planets in the habitable zone. But in those cases, you won't be seeing the planet. You would just like get the upper limit on the, the mass of the planet. Uh, and um, we would have to then basically look at that target uh, take direct images of direct image of that target using the next generation uh, space telescope. I think it's a good illustration though, how all of our observatories, they don't exist in silos. We all work together <laughs> in order to bring the science together. So da Gemini is not able to do everything, but the th we can't, what we can do contributes to science of other, other fields as well, or other uh, observatories. Well, we try to do it. We, we do try <laughs> to do it. We try to do as much as we can. <laughs> Jamika, you had your uh, hand raised? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, I would just like to say again, wonderful questions. Thank you so much. I am keeping busy trying to put little white question marks by all of them so they can stand out to, to all of our, our wonderful guides here, Emily, Garima, Brian, Denise, Mark, and uh, myself trying to answer a few as well too. Um, but uh, I would like to also point out that the Shadow of the Scientist founder, Raja Guhathakurtha, has joined us. Raja, let me find you someplace and make you a co-host so you can say hello. Um, let me find you. I just want to point out, Jamika, and hi, Raja. <laughs> um, I just want to point out that we're, we are actually taking observations right now. So oh, okay. Okay. Um, for, for people that either just joined us or 
um, didn't uh, quite understand when I was mentioning um, the, the movements that we were making. We're actually taking observations right now. You can see this orange timer. It says exposure remaining. Um, you can see the star and the so the target star is in the uh, upper left here. Um, and uh, we're getting uh, light from that star through this uh, circular aperture here. It's being sent into the instrument. So we are actually taking a very a long 30 minute exposure right now. Um, so it's not that we're just uh, chatting and not doing anything. <laughs> we are actually using the, this big old telescope that we have on this big old mountain um, to look at uh, something very far away. And that speaks to one of the questions, which was how long um, do you do you um, stay on a star or a target? And I believe that was Emily who answered that. Of course, it depends on the distance of the target, the magnitude of the target, uh, and and several other factors as well. So it's it's uh, that was perfect. Um, Brian, could you or Garima or Mark or Denise or Emily, anyone, could you tell us what we're seeing in the uh, the bottom? of the image there, this um, red and kind of blue or purpley um, looking images? Yeah, sure, I'd be happy to. So um, these are, uh, this is the uh, previous image um, that was taken with uh, Maroon X. This is actually a spectrum. So the one on the, uh, is this actually right? I think they're color coded correctly. I'm a bit surprised that the red is on the left. Um, but so we have um, two different channels. So there's a what's called a dichroic in Maroon X. So it splits the light at a certain wavelength. Um, and so uh, half the light is basically, the red half of the light is piped to one detector. The blue half of the light is piped to another detector. And this is an optical detector. So I mentioned that we were normally looking in the infrared, but um, Maroon X looks at brighter stars so we can actually look on a, a night where the moon is is fairly bright um and so we're using uh, on the right is the optical blue detector so this is what humans would see as blue uh on the left is the um optical red so what basically what humans would see as red um it's a little bit false color but more or less um and so there's a bunch of different things that you see there you can see some in the red especially you can see these uh, three almost horizontal bands uh, uh, running across. And then there's a series of like tick marks almost. So like uh, yellow uh, vertical lines. And then you see a, a series of uh, horizontal bands again, and then a series of uh, tick marks again. And so um, the bands are different orders of light. So basically different wavelengths. Um, a mission from, so this is a spectrum of the previous star that was being observed. Um, and so it's just a, a mission, like the strength of the emission, the brightness of, of that particular star at a, a single wavelength over and over and over again. So um, when we take spectroscopy, uh, this one meter per second that we talked about earlier, uh, wavelength can be translated through the Doppler shift um uh into velocity offset and so you can see these when you take a series of observations so if we were able to look at all the observations that were taken of this star over the course of six months let's say we would see if there was a exoplanet or a brown dwarf or a, a you know a companion um a star around uh, around this star you'd see little movements of these uh, uh lines emission lines or absorption lines um, you'd see uh, little movements left to right uh, that would indicate uh, actual physical movement of that star. Uh, it's complicated because the Milky Way turns, the Earth turns around the sun. So there's all these things that you have to take into account. Um, also, the instrument stability is, um, you know, on a given night, we don't always have the same exact, you know, on this point in the detector, this corresponds to... 732.6 nanometers. Uh, and so a lot of ast uh, astronomical observations are calibrating out uh, instrumental, let's call them defects, or you know something having to do with the instrument, uh, uh, the telescope structure, the atmosphere, uh, so on and so forth. There's always contaminants. There's always things that we have to remove 
in order to understand what's the intrinsic uh, spectrum of that source. And so this, um, these tick marks here are actually an internal um, calibrator in Maroon X that's telling us on a given night, this location corresponds to this wavelength. And so we all, always have that running and um, it'll give us the precision that we, uh, that we want. And so I think this is one of like the big upgrades that Maroon X has that allows for this precision, going back to uh, Grima's uh, question. Um, this is like um, a way that we can get higher precision with these types of instruments is to have like an internal calibrator. And so this is very clever to, to have something like this. And I don't know how much this was used before, although this is not my area of expertise at all. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I was focused on the question. <laughs> What's up? There's a lot of exciting questions in the chat. Yeah, yeah, it looks like uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm. So there's one question that we're each taking turns and typing out, if, um, and that was, um, what is the most exciting question for you right now? And I, that observe, that uh, Gemini could help answer. Uh, okay, I'm I could give my total you. bias <laughs> perspective here. <laughs> I think uh, everybody has, everybody has their own. <laughs> 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 Okay. Um, well, I, I think, uh, okay, I'll give maybe a slightly more objective answer. I don't know. Am I even capable of that? All right. A slightly more objective answer than a subjective answer. Uh, the uh, slightly objective answer is that um, Gemini is extremely good. We're better than a lot of other telescopes at what's called target of opportunities. So um, when things go bang in the universe, or when there's a gravitational wave event. So this is something that's, that's only been uh, uh, able to be detected by humans as of oh, seven, 2015. 2015, it was, 2015 so nine, was nine the years first ago. One, yeah. um, so less than a decade, we've had the technology to be able to measure gravitational waves, gravitational wave events um, on Earth. And this is uh, uh, thought to be due to coalescence of stellar remnants, so neutron stars, uh, so basically the inner cores, dense inner cores of dead stars uh, falling into one another, um, uh, merging black holes, these kind of things. And there's actual stretching of space time that's measured uh, at an observatory called LIGO. And uh, when um, a measurement happens, uh, LIGO only uh, basically listens to the uh, vibrations coming from this coalescence event. And so immediately at that point, a bunch of scientists say, oh my gosh, something super interesting happened there. Uh, can anybody slew their telescope there? And we'll look for the, the optical or near infrared counterpart of that. So was there a bang? What happened? Uh, can we see anything? Gas outflowing, uh, an explosion, what? Uh, and we get a trigger here at Gemini that says, you'll actually hear it if it happens, and it'll say, attention, target of opportunity. And that can happen at any time. In fact, uh, uh, now that we're in nighttime operations, Mark is in charge of that. So if if somebody in the in the anybody in the world says, "Oh my gosh, something uh, super interesting just happened in the universe," and they have a program on Gemini that's kind of latent, so it basically sits there waiting. They they say, "We think something exciting is going to happen." Statistically speaking, something exciting is going to happen. Uh, uh, you know, in the next six months, and so we're going to bank on it. And uh, we give them, you know, ten hours. Uh, to, then they, they, whenever they see uh, see something exciting from another observatory, uh, they can do what's called trigger uh, an observation on Gemini. And so that'll come into us. It'll say uh, that we have software that alerts us of of this trigger. And then, depending on the type of trigger, it could be what what we call a rapid target of opportunity. Uh, we may have to sue there immediately. And so it could be that we're taking an observation. You know, Mark's doing a, a 30 minute observation on Maroon X right now, and he gets an attention target of opportunity. And it says, uh, this is a rapid target of opportunity, disrupt the queue and immediately slew. Uh, we would do that. So we would stop the observation that Maroon X can't be stopped actually, but <laughs> we just move. Um, we'd, uh, uh, we'd move immediately. We go to that target and within, if all goes well, within three minutes, we'd be on, on source and taking an observation. That is that is hard with other telescopes, and we have the capability with this this tertiary, this deployable tertiary, to move instruments very fast. So if somebody says, "I want a near infrared spectrum of that object," I want an optical image of that 
uh, object and I want an, uh, uh, an optical spectrum, we can do that really, really quickly. Whereas for other observatories, it would take uh, quite a bit longer and they're not as used to it. So I think Gemini is spectacular for that. It's it's very agile. It can move quick. The telescope itself can move quick. The dome can move quick. Uh, our instrument suite can move quick. Um, that's the pseudo objective answer. I'll, st I'll stop with that. I'll stop with that. Oh, well, one question with that relating to that, it was, um, I already lost it, was uh, why, why can't it stop? Why is it hard to like switch and why is Gemini better at switching. And part of that answer is in that diagram, you saw that all the instruments under Gemini are all attached to the, the telescope. So if you need to stop an observation and switch to something else, you don't need to go up to the telescope itself, take off an instrument and put a different instrument back on. You, in the same time, you can just switch to sky and then switch it to one of the other instruments in that instrument block. Yeah, and also our our instruments are not as heavy as uh, instruments at other observatories. So like, uh, uh, so Subaru, which is a telescope right nearby Gemini, uh, has um, uh, an instrument called the Hyper Supreme Cam, and I think the one filter for the Hyper Supreme Cam weighs as much as one of our instruments. I did not know that. I, I don't know. I, there might be an exaggeration. Maybe it's two filters, but I mean, they're, they're, it's a huge it's instrument. It's just uh, like absolutely gargantuan. And um, Actually, yeah. Actually, I was there last night and I saw the there was a very big poster like at the entrance and you see like a little girl standing and then the instrument is like huge like that. Yeah. Yeah. And so they, uh, HSC, it's got to be a bounded prime focus, right? I guess it's such a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in, in any case, the, like uh, a lot of um, in, like on, on the CAC telescopes, a lot of their instruments are sitting on a platform at the side of the telescope, so they're not actually mounted to the telescope. They're what's called a Nasmith platform, and uh, that platform has to move around. Uh, the precision of the of the piping of the light has to uh, it has to be checked. Um, it's it's basically a detached structure, and so. It's uh, it takes a lot more careful movement to get in uh, in proper location to be able to observe with another instrument. Here we can just flip the mirror. The mirror is very precise. The tertiary mirror is very precise. It can, it's we actually tested this recently, and it's less than 0.1 arc second is its error in in movement. So it it's really precise, and we can go flip back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and uh, totally fine. Um, so that's that's awesome. That's an awesome capability. I, I love that about Gemini. My targets are, are the things that I look at are very, very faint. Uh, they're usually about 100 million times fainter than the human eye can see. Um, so I'm used to very long observations sitting with one instrument. So uh, Gemini can be used for that. And I have a, a program in Gemini South that's doing that this semester. Um, but um, usually... It, it's not the best use of Gemini. It, it, uh, Gemini is very good at, at doing a lot of different things at once. I still want them to observe it. <laughs> <laughs> it's still cool science. So one question came in, and if you'll allow me to just nerd out about gravitational totally, waves totally for a little bit. It, yeah. um, <laughs> so the question away. is, what is the challenges uh, come across when using... Uh, when Gemini is used to study gravitational waves. Uh, so something to clarify is uh, Gemini cannot be used to study gravitational waves themselves. <laughs> um, but a, a little bit of background on gravitational waves in case uh, anyone might not know what they are. Uh, gravitational waves were predicted by Einstein. Um, and essentially, if you imagine the fabric of the universe, uh, gravitational waves are essentially ripples within the fabric of the universe itself. And gravitational waves are produced whenever you have something in the universe that has mass and th that mass moves. It creates that ripple across space time. Very similar to uh, a common analogy is if you imagine a pond that's nice, flat and smooth, and if you imagine like a stick insect or an insect moving across the top of that pond, every time it's moving its legs, it's causing those ripples that go across 
across space. Gravitational waves had been predicted by Einstein, but had not been detected until 2015 through the LIGO detector. And I see Jamika's putting in some great information about LIGO and other gravitational wave detectors. Gravitational wave detectors uh, need to be set up in very different ways from that are quite different from an observatory, especially an optical observatory. Uh, for one thing, they typically need to be built underground. And for us speaking here in Hawaii, that is not possible in Hawaii. We're lava rock all the way down. We're not gonna be able to have a lot of gravitational wave detector here. But what makes gravitational waves uh, so interesting is that the way that gravitational waves are produced are completely separate by how light is produced. Light is produced uh, roughly if you have an atom and you have the electrons in the atom, the electrons to go from one level down to another level, and that will produce light. That's electromagnetic radiation, and there's many ways that you can create light uh, or produce light sort of thing. Gravitational waves are created completely differently. It's fabric of the universe uh, getting rippled out. And so what's so exciting about gravitational waves is that for the first time in the entire history of humanity, we found a way that we could study things in the universe that is completely disconnected from light. <laughs> to go back to all of our ancestors, the entire basis of science, of, of astronomy, is all around light observations. And there's different forms of light observations. You, uh, telescopes that are constructed for submillimeter or radio light are constructed differently, but they're still studying light. Gravitational waves are not light at all. So that's one of the reasons why it's so exciting to me is now that we finally have this second thing that we can use to study the universe, we're going to be able to cross reference all of the things that we know about astronomy before as we are refining how to utilize gravitational okay. waves. Now, getting into the question of how can Gemini be using it? Well, Gemini, we, we're a light bucket. We're, we're an observatory. We're set up in order to be observing light. But as we are getting um, more uh, detection of, of gravitational waves, some of the things that are producing gravitational waves are also events in the universe that are creating light. So the very first gravitational wave observation was two black holes colliding. It was so unexpected that no um, light observatories were looking at it in the same direction. And sometimes gravitational wave things might not necessarily create light. In 2017, there was a gravitational wave detection of two neutron stars colliding called a kilonova, and those produce a lot of light. So when that happened, Gemini, a bunch of observatories around the world went target of opportunity straight over to it in order to look at it to, for the first time ever, observe something first with gravitational waves and then observe it with light and be able to cross-reference that data. And actually that observation, um, that I know this is 2017, so this is years old, but I remember reading papers about how that observation was used to confirm the Hubble constant, <laughs> because mm -hmm. we were able in order to cross-reference uh, those that data in two different ways. Um, so how can Gemini, how does Gemini play a part of this? And Gemini, that answer to that question is tying a lot into what Brian says is that Gemini will get target of opportunities that a gravitational wave event has been detected and then we will stop what we're doing and go look at that area of the sky and see what can be seen. And as we're getting, detecting more and more gravitational wave events, we're going to start to detect smaller, um, less dramatic gravitational wave events. And over the course of the next 30 years, we're really going to be defining how to detect things with gravitational waves and what that means for our science. Yeah, that's awesome. I was just actually thinking as you were saying all this, that um, we're going to have telescopes coming online soon, uh, like Chile, for example, that are monitoring in optical, uh, mm -hmm. optical light, effectively the whole entire southern part of the sky over a cadence of, you know, a couple of nights. And I wonder, because we're going to have, you know, there's going to be transient events, things are going to explode, mm -hmm. um, happens in the universe. Yeah. Uh, and we're going to get triggered and we're going to go take a, a spectra or or other images of, of these sources. I wonder if we're then going to feed that back to LIGO and say, hey, 
Why Maybe you check that check, out. Yeah. Uh, like at this at this exact moment, did you happen to see anything? And and you know, it's yeah. hard to pay, pull out these signals because they're, as far as I understand, they're like one part in in a billion, 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 something like that. It, there, it's it's really. I, I'm also not trained or be looking at LIGO signals, but it does look like a lot of noise. Yeah. Um, I do know the very first gravi- the first uh, black hole detection, like they were just turning on LIGO just to make sure that it worked. They weren't doing any observations, and that they just turned it on to just test it, and that's when they found the first black hole merger. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and the thing with the Kilo Nova is um, that detection of the gravitational wave and then Gemini uh, observing it with Kilo Nova, uh, Kilo Nova neutron star mergers had been predicted for a long time, not been observed. Even though they made light, no one was looking at the right place at the right time in order to find a Kilo Nova. So we needed to have gravitational waves uh, to understanding for us to find that first Kilo Nova. But I was, I was gonna. I'm laughing though because LIGO right now, in the current state, LIGO is definitely used to being the ones of going like, "Hey, we found something cool. Now everybody else go look at it." <laughs> and maybe a couple in like a decade or so, it's gonna tables are gonna be turned, and we're gonna find the cool things and have LIGO go yeah, look at it. <laughs> but it's it's amazingly synergistic, anyways. In the end, like I mean, the fact that we see something uh, makes the statistical significance of anything that they see higher so it it makes it it allows them to pull signal out of the noise because it, it, these events are correlated in some way right the gravitational wave as you mentioned has a genesis an astronomical gen- genesis right yeah. and so uh and so if we see a violent event occur chances that their little tiny signal that they you know potentially see in their data is real is much higher mm-hmm. at that particular location so we can talk with one another it's a collaborative effort and you know even speaking to the 2017 event i mean many of those papers had like hundreds of authors on them hundreds of scientists uh from all over the world at at observatories at academic institutions that were part of these uh uh getting pulling this little tiny signal out and then and then understanding what it actually meant yeah and this is one of the wonderful things about science is, is that it's amazingly collaborative, and that's that. That's not only among the scientists, but among the observatories, because we all see different things. Mm-hmm. Uh, an X-ray observatory sees something completely different from what we see, and it totally changes the picture of the universe. If you look in the infrared versus looking in the optical, things change dramatically. And if we didn't talk to one another, we'd get the wrong picture yeah. of 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 what we're seeing. So I just want to mention we did uh, we did just slew, so we just moved. Uh, so this is not the same target. You may notice that uh, in the same uh, graphical user interface here, uh, the star um, that's in the center is fainter than the star that we that we just looked at. Um, and actually down here is the spectrum of the previous uh, star that we looked at. So this, is, this has been read out um, and you can see a bunch of lines here. A lot of them are from the atmosphere probably, um, absorption and emission lines um, from the atmosphere. Um, but some of these are coming uh, directly from the the star itself that was just observed. I think there's an interesting question uh, regarding the challenges that we face at Gemini. Um, mm-hmm. Wait. Yeah, so I think I did mention a few. I don't know if you want to like elaborate that a further a little bit further because that's important that's important to talk about basically to tell yeah. everybody that nothing is nothing is perfect <laughs> <laughs> and like how basically our life looks like every day yeah yeah i mean i don't know it's, it's science is not going well if you don't have problems i mean then you're not trying very hard uh so you you like there's always going to be problems and uh it's it's nice astronomy is nice when everything's working and right now uh, you know, I don't want to jinx anybody in the control room, but things are going pretty well. So the instruments, <laughs> the instruments are behaving. Uh, the telescope is behaving. The weather, uh, I'm assuming, is still incredible. Do, do you have a seeing measurement for tonight? I guess you do from Renex, yeah, or from the juniors. Uh, it's, yeah, it's great. It's about half an arc second or better. It's been like that all night. Okay, so we're in the 20th percentile uh, best uh, seeing, so atmospheric blurring. 
uh, that we get on uh, Mauna Kea. So it's it's a clear night. Uh, yes, the moon is out, but that doesn't bother us so much in the infrared or when we're looking at bright stars. Um, and the atmosphere is not uh, blurring out our sources very much. So this is, you know, this is great, perfect. I'm sure, I'm sure it's going to go great for the rest of the night. No problems. But as I mentioned earlier, we have 80 staff. Uh, we have people from all different backgrounds. Um, and so, you know, we have an incredible number of subsystems. Uh, that's, you know, the the dome structure, the telescope structure itself, all the instruments encased in the in the um, in, in the cast cage. Uh, we're observing with Maroon X right now, so this is all the team in Chicago that does not even counted among those eighty staff members. Um, we have uh, you know the mirror. We have all sorts of electronic subsystems for each one of these components. We have tons of software, um, and so we have people on call uh, all night. So a, a person. Uh, from the software group, uh, a person that has engineering knowledge, a person that has knowledge of uh, instruments. If um, we have a challenge where we're not really sure, you know, the sky is big. <laughs> it's it's a big ass sky out there, um, and uh, there's a, a you know a, a lot of a lot of stars and galaxies to be found. Um, sometimes it's a challenge to find which is the right one that we're attempting to look at, and so. Uh, during the day, I and, and other scientists here, um, Mark also has this role, work very closely to the with the teams that propose for the observations to make sure at nighttime it's as foolproof as possible so that we know, you know, as best as we can do beforehand uh, what exactly we're looking at. Um, and so the observer can go right over to that location and say, okay, aha, that's the star, that's the galaxy that uh, they want to look at. But sometimes we get confused still it's it can be very complicated um crowded fields you know maybe you're not totally sure and so usually what we do is we have this big uh you know pool of observations that we can draw upon and so if there's any doubt about what the particular target is unless it's like a super time critical one so like let's say somebody does this trigger and they say i really want to look at this uh event that just happened at that point, we actually require that they put their phone number down. Um, and so it doesn't matter where they are in the world, what time it is. They obviously just clicked a button. <laughs> so they're obviously <laughs> awake um, and they're excited about this object. So we call them and we say and we actually talk with the, the scientists and we say, hey, we're you know, we share our screen just like I'm sharing the screen right now. And we say, uh, is this what you're is this what you want to look at? Or is it that thing over to the left or the thing over to the right? Um, you know, we use maybe a little bit more technical terms than that, but uh, that's the basic idea. And they say, yes, no, yes. And then, uh, and then we're on the source. So if not, um, then we'll just, we'll just move on to another observation and that'll be taken care of uh, in the daytime, probably myself or another one of the scientists will talk with the, the team and then uh, we'll figure out better what, what uh, they want to look at. And then we'll send it back to, to nighttime. Um, so this happens also with instruments. If an instrument fails, like let's say genius fails, I'm actually, one of two people that are more or less responsible for juniors. They don't call me in the middle of the night. I'm not on call 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, mercifully. Um, so if, you know, juniors goes down in the nighttime, unless I'm there and I can uh, troubleshoot or um, uh, the scientists that are in Denise's role, they're very adept at, uh, you know, uh, like diagnosing and fixing a lot of mechanical issues. Um, if, if that can't be done, if, you know, we try for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and it seems like things aren't going well, uh, we'll try to use other instruments. So we'll just switch over to other observations. Maybe we'll take more with uh, GMOS or Maroon X. So some combination of like having an incredible amount of expertise on hand that you can draw from if you need to. Um, and also the adaptability of Gemini. If an instrument goes down, like I've been at Keck before where an instrument went down and they're like, we have one other instrument to offer you and it has nothing to do with your science. So what do you want to do with it? And that's that's very painful because you have this amazing telescope uh, and you, you don't really know what to do with it. We always know what to do. We always have a backup plan. Um, and that's, that's another really amazing uh, aspect of the observatory. And I'll just add to that, like when we have like an instrument that's not working, let's say, so the next day, basically, you know, whoever is responsible for that instrument will basically sit down and then diagnose the problem. And let's say like, if you want to, uh, you know, if you 
have like some hardware failures and then you get a new hardware and then you want to test it on sky so we do have like engineering uh, night uh, so we can like before starting the science observation we can dedicate like an hour or two hours of like engineering night with the with the instrument so just to kind of like check that everything is working or if we have like maybe um, you know, if you have upgraded the software or installed like new optics and you just want to check that everything's like behaving the way it's supposed to behave. So we can actually dedicate, you know, a couple of hours out of the science night to just do all the end. So that was a great question. That's important. Yeah, and actually, we were going to do that tonight. That was going to be uh, engineering. The first couple hours was going to be engineering, testing our adaptive optic system, uh, specifically uh, a laser that we use as an artificial star um, uh, that is, is used to measure the uh, scintillation, twinkling of the of the of the um, uh, the movement of the atmosphere, basically. Um, so what effect does the, the movement of the atmosphere have on this artificial star? And then we make a correction to our optics uh, in order to correct the light coming from our real object. Um, and that is very complicated. And we decided to, we were thinking that we were going to be able to do it tonight. And we decided we wanted a little bit more time to uh, uh, understand some things. Oh, well, we didn't get the cue. That, that was part of it, yes. <laughs> it gave it, <laughs> I didn't want to say exactly that. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact that we didn't have clearance, uh, which so I mean, this, these are reasonably powerful lasers. They're not going to hurt anything in the in the uh, upper atmosphere. But you know, we want to be prudent, and so we want to make sure that there's no satellites that we're shooting lasers at and anything like that. So we have to speak with. Uh, there's actually a place called the Laser Clearing House. It's funny; it sounds made up. But um, but we have to clear windows with them, and so they give us some real windows and some fake windows so we can't figure out exactly where the satellites are. Um, and then uh, and then we we can use those to observe. So um, uh, those, it takes a while. It's sometimes it's a bit complicated to get those those windows uh, set. And so uh, we didn't get those for tonight. Um, and But it also offers us more opportunity to think about some of the subcomponents of the adaptive. Christoph was talking today about some subcomponent that was potentially off. So. So yeah, it's a lot of a lot of work, and it's a nice feedback loop. And you do some daytime work, some nighttime work, and maybe you do nighttime work for an hour. You say, "Ah, eh, it's not really working." We give the telescope back, and then you go assess those those data and, and try to figure out what what happened. Can you all talk about what happens during the day while the telescope itself is not in use for observations? Uh, sure. Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, uh, so, well, it, it changes day by day and as, as things change day by night, uh, the, the pattern is there, but you know, what we do on a specific day highly depends on, uh, our needs for that day. So it, so for example, let's say we're changing out an instrument. Well, uh, that process starts very early in the morning. We have people that drive up to the summit, uh, effectively every weekday. Um, and uh, they'll start very early in the morning and they'll start unbolting the, the one instrument. Uh, they have giant cranes and platforms to make sure that you know everything is moves nice and slow and it's well supported. And then they'll slowly remove uh, the instrument from the, the cast enclosure. Um, and uh, they'll put that instrument off to the side and then they'll pick up uh, another instrument that you know, is the replacement instrument, and uh, they'll move that very slowly. Then they'll bolt that on. Um, then they'll go get some well-deserved lunch <laughs> and take take a break. And then uh, us down here uh, will um, kind of calibrate that that instrument. So we'll work to um, make sure that the light's going in the right location. That um, you know, kind of uh, our expectations of how that instrument performs. Uh, are within the within the the, the tolerances, um, and if we see something wrong, we may ask the people at the summit to you know unbolt something and, and move an instrument, or we may just have to do some internal work. Um, and so that process can take a while. That can take an entire day. Um, and uh, you know, 
there's a there's a feedback loop between us down here and people at the summit um and uh and sometimes we don't even get it ready by nighttime and so we we built a contingency in in those cases and you know we have plans that are without that instrument with that instrument um on a given on a given day um there can be testing for new software so we can act like we have something called full motion testing where we move the telescope to different locations and and take like fake images basically and we can see if our software crashes um uh, we do uh, all sorts of uh, engineering work um the mirror can be cleaned um the uh, uh there's a ton of work to be done at the summit. There's a ton of work to be done down here, just even taking normal calibrations, just making sure that the instruments from day to day are stable, uh, because all of this is, you know, if if we're not precise and accurate, if our instruments are not precise and accurate, then what we take at nighttime doesn't really matter, or we're giving people bad information. And so we need to make sure that when the night starts, Mark and Denise have no problems. Everything is set up. We know things are within specifications. And we're ready to go do science because otherwise that's a lot of wasted effort and money and time by everybody. And so in these last 14 minutes, um, I uh, would appreciate if we could maybe talk about what we can expect in future sessions. Uh, and while everyone is also still answering all these awesome questions in the chat, um, we're hoping to have uh, these uh, these students and the rest of our participants join us again um, um, in, in the future. So we have another session with Gemini coming up in October, um, followed by a little bit of downtime. So uh, what can we expect um, in October, especially as it relates to the kinds of observations you're doing right now, since we're kind of at the beginning of the semester of observing? Yeah, so, um, you know, any night uh, can be different on Gemini. Um, it's true, most telescopes, uh, the weather is incredibly stable tonight, um, so far anyways. And so, you know, we love that, but it doesn't always happen. And so we have to adapt to the conditions. And that means uh, maybe looking at brighter targets or changing the instruments that we use. Um, we have an adaptive optic system, which uh, I just mentioned we were attempting to do some engineering work tonight. We are going to do uh, likely do that in a couple of days. If that is successful, uh, we will have our one component of our adaptive optic system back um, up and working. Um, and we can use that then for science, which is incredible. Um, it, it takes, um, you know, objects that are very blurry and makes them, uh, makes it very sharp. So that's, um, that's really important when you're doing, when you're looking at certain types of objects. Um, our instrumentation suite for next month's session is going to be roughly the same. Uh, one big change is I will move from this chair to Mark's chair, so I will actually be uh, observing. <laughs> um, and um, it'll be our last night before a one month long shutdown. <clears throat> so we'll be uh, trying to get the last observations of objects that are, you know, just starting to set in the uh, are setting early in the evening. Um, uh, uh, in our pool of observation. So we'll, the, the beginning of the night, I'm sure will be very exciting. We'll be trying to get the, the last observations uh, before we go uh, to sleep for a month. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, and that's exactly when we'll have the session. So I'm, I'm sure it'll be, I'm sure it'll be very exciting if the, the conditions are good. And if the conditions are not good, then we'll, we'll do our best to, to see what we can see. Um, so I, I would actually pass to Grima for maybe talking a little bit of, about the adaptive optic system and the engineering work that we we're going to do, uh, just in kind of general terms, like what, why would we want this thing? It's really complicated and it's a lot of work, but it's, uh, I think it's worthwhile. Uh, do you mind telling people like kind of what it does and, and why we'd want it? Sure. Yeah. Why not? Um, so I think Brian mentioned like what adaptive optics is basically, you know, when you have like 
um, the light that comes from the astronomical object is basically traveling in plane waves, but when it meets the Earth's atmosphere, um, the the waves get distorted, basically. I should speak louder. Um, so we basically use adaptive optic system to untwinkle the star or basically sharpen the images of, uh, of a star. And so for some science observation, um, you know, we... Um, so for for, to, for the adaptive optics, basically, you need to observe um, a, a bright star to be able to measure the phase aberrations in the wavefront to basically apply the correction as well with the AO. But sometimes what happens, like, you know, you're, you can't use your science uh, target as your guide star to do the adaptive optics. So... Sometimes we need to basically create an artificial star, which is called the laser guide source. So what we do in L it's called LGS also. So um, so what we do basically, we shoot the laser in sky, uh, and we uh, like at about ninety kilometer of altitude, there is like a sodium layer. So the we shoot the laser um, basically to excite the sodium atoms, and we look at the backscattered light uh, to basically. Um, um, be able to, uh, you know, do do the correction with the AO. So that LGS mode is not working at the moment. So basically, um, and that's what we are trying to understand. Is it? It seems more like a hardware problem. And uh, so we're gonna be the student scientist, which is actually responsible for that, is going through all the um, the well the procedure basically uh, when to you know, what, if this is, is a hardware problem, so do we basically, how do we get the funding to actually uh, get the new optics to replace the hardware? Uh, that's one question that maybe we may be looking into, and then we're gonna basically be, when we'll have the clearance, we will be shooting the laser in, in sky to basically, again, acquire some more data and see if we can fix the issue, uh, what kind of solutions we can come up with so that we can offer this mode to the community. So that's the engineering work that we need to do, and it's gonna take it may take a couple of hours, but it might take a couple of months to fix as well. Uh, so we just basically need to coordinate with the you know the the science team and the instrument team, and you know to basically uh, uh, get that work done. All right. And so. Uh, if everything is uh, works out well, then uh, within a couple of weeks, we should be able to take observations with this mode. And I think we already have several science cases waiting for that. So I know in uh, the high resolution IFU for Genius, the newly commissioned one, there's uh, there's observations of distance galaxies that are uh, just awaiting this mode. So basically getting very a uh, fine spatial uh, resolution of uh, galaxies that are, oh, like 11 billion light years away, something like that, um, to see wh uh, whether the galaxies are made up of different components that, that, uh, that have just merged with one another, to see the rate of star formation in, in those galaxies, um, to see how those galaxies are moving, um, and to try to understand the origin of, the, of those galaxies. So this mode, uh, we couldn't do that without without this mode. Um, and so it's uh, a very powerful capability that we don't currently have. And thank you, Emily, for answering that question. Um, I was going to um, ask you maybe to speak on it a little bit too about uh, visiting Gemini and uh, tours for high school students, community members in order to um, help them be more um, engaged with and understand better the science that comes out of such an amazing place. Yeah, and that, that's my whole job. <laughs> so, and, and I think it also speaks to uh, the variety of careers at, in the sciences because you have the people 
who are working on the deep in-depth things on instruments or to con or connecting or reducing data. And you also ha can have people like me that I just got really good at talking with people and info dumping about my favorite scientific topics. And so, and being able to use uh, skills like that in order to connect um, astronomy, bring it down to earth and make sure that we can connect it with people. So uh, we link together the uh, tours that we do both for of our summit facility and of our Gila base facility. And I also mentioned our largest Hawaii Islands largest and also longest running education engagement program of Journey Through the Universe, where we connect a variety of STEAM professionals across the observatories to our Hawaii schools for classroom presentations. And, um, and one of the best things about that program is connecting with students and also just showing that our observatory has a great variety of roles and people that work here. And it's very easy for many people to think that to work at an observatory that you have to spend 10 years in order to get a PhD in astronomy to even think about stepping in the building. While a majority of our staff are engineering uh, in some way, one way or another, whether that be mechanical or software engineering. And sometimes a, uh, an important skill set is if you go home and you fix your car on the weekends. That can be a skill set that can transfer into a job in, in science, engineering, and math. So, Jamika, I'm uh, wondering if we could take the last couple of minutes uh, to go to the control room just to see what we might be doing for the rest of the night, or at least what the plan is. If, Mark, you're comfortable telling us kind of what uh what you're hoping to observe for, for the rest of the night ah uh right um we've got a whole bunch of maroon x observations coming up um so a lot of the rest of the night is going to look a lot like it does right now um in terms of the interfaces and stuff um we do have a gmos observation in the middle of the night So just really quickly, this is uh this is what you're yeah. looking at. So this is the, yeah. your plan for the night, and you have uh, yeah. one of these is an individual program, and uh, uh, the uh, width of these lines is how long you spend on that observation. And so uh, right now yeah. you're, yeah. yeah, okay. And so um, yeah, so that's a half. What is that? A half hour, roughly twenty minutes, something like that. Yeah. Uh, and so you have the rest of your night is going to be busy. <laughs> You and Denise yeah, are going to yeah. be busy. That's what uh, that's what you kind of dread as an observer. Seeing uh, when you start the night is uh, yeah. If you're lucky, you get one that looks like that. <laughs> yeah. So those are longer block observations. Um, but yeah, it sounds like the rest of the night's going to be busy with a lot of brunex, uh, slewing, big slews, yeah. and uh, and monitoring. I think there's I think there's a program that you go to like. Five or six times tonight. Is that right? That's I was right. talking yeah. about yeah. So yeah, Teo like... stopped Teo stopped by to comment on this one actually. He had, he asked that I switch a couple of the observations late in the night of around to, to get the timing right because they need to be spaced out enough so that people can get measurements of things as they're orbiting, basically. Okay. So this is yeah, probably a, a star with a known uh yeah. binary system and then just taking observations of that to get yeah. It's what what they call a transit yeah yeah okay so yeah <laughs> uh, yeah some uh i think there was actually also potentially a tr like a four-hour transit this evening but uh osco decided to go with this um this yep. uh kind of monitoring program so it was either you had you guys had to do like <laughs> 50 observations or one four-hour observation and Luckily, you got yep. the uh, 50, keep you awake. You got the 50, 10 minute observations. Yeah, it's kind of hard to stay awake when you're doing a far observation at starting at 1 a.m. Because then it, you have to sit through 3 a.m. and everybody gets tired then. And yeah, yeah. you just got to kind of stay awake. So drink well, lots of coffee. Yeah. What, that's what the target of opportunity alarms are for. <laughs> yeah. Just to make sure you don't actually doze off. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. Well, we can go just back, check the 
check the weather again. Um, but it looks like everything is beautiful on the summit still. Yeah. The world so we actually possible. predicted that. Yeah, we wonder about the possibility of cloud off to the north, but it's all a little bit early on, but it seems to have disappeared. So, yeah, yeah it's looking yeah, beautiful again tonight. Yeah, they were predicting a little bit of cloud cover, but um, seems like seems like we're good. And and for the folks who are listening, we can still observe through some cloud as well. So we if if it's not too thick, we can set we can do spectroscopy because if we if we're trying to measure the how, exactly how bright a star or an object is photometry, then it matters. We need we need a clear line of sight. But if we're doing spectroscopy, we're not so concerned about that generally, and so we can observe that through so through some cloud, as long as we can see through it. These have been absolutely wonderful questions, and I am so thankful to Emily, Garima, Brian, Denise, Mark, everyone um, for engaging with us, answering those questions in the chat and giving even more detail aloud um, as, as you were going throughout the session tonight. This has been so much fun, so engaging. Uh, students who are with us uh, from the LGP, um, at uh, Ashoka University and for all of our participants, we are eternally grateful for not only your support and participation, but for spreading the word about Shadow the Scientist to those who may be interested. And if you are indeed here um, looking at some of the um, chat conversations, if you are here on the Big Island or in Hawaii in general, and you'd like to do more uh, get more engaged um, and hands-on with astronomy and maybe even come uh, to do a site tour of Gemini or other observatories uh, at the base facility, um, please get in contact with me or any uh, of the team, I imagine, especially um, Emily. So I'm going to put my email here in the chat feel free to email me directly and I will certainly um, do my best to connect you with opportunities. Uh, Emily is certainly the go-to, uh, one of many go-to people at Gemini uh, to make this happen as she was just talking about one of their large outreach events. Um, but uh, the the base facility tours, summit tours, um, and even just special events happen um, quite regularly. Um, at Gemini and at the observatories in general. Uh, Emily, would you want to say anything else uh, about that for for those who are local and would like to um, really connect with you all? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think of what are our, ne our next public events coming up. So we do our monthly public tours, both of, I mentioned before, both of the summit facility and of the base facility. Uh, our base facility tours are the second Friday of each month, and then our summit tours are every other Thursday. Uh, however, we will be taking a pause on our summit tours uh, starting in mid-October, since the, um, the telescope's going to have a brief shutdown um, in order to clean and do some instrument maintenance and so the uh, we'll pause on tours during that time period. Uh, if you are local, uh, do keep an eye out for the Kama'aina Observatory experience where our local island residents will have um, tours specifically designed for them in order to help get them up the mountain and be able to see the observatory and the facilities. Uh, some other public events uh, coming up um, in just a couple couple weeks we are going to have our giga years conference and certain panels of that's of that conference is going to be open for our public or actually all, all panels or yeah oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Brian's the, ma the main coordinator for that. I'm just yeah, assisting yeah. wherever yeah, I can. Yeah. Um, that is going to be a bit dense uh, in some areas, but it's going to have some really fantastic conversation of all the science happening in the very first er eras of the universe. Um, Additional public events, uh, we're currently planning our Journey Through the Universe program, which will, many of the events will be taking place uh, next year in early February. Uh, but if you're looking for something a little bit closer in time, uh, 
November 2nd on the west side of the island at Kona Commons, we'll be having our Astro Day West, where uh, all the observatories and different science in institutes across the island will be meeting at the Kona, Kona Commons uh, for different science activities and questions and all different types of fun things. Um, and also, and of course, every single month, we do a public Shadow the Scientist session, and we every time we're talking about something different so even if you came this time you want to jump in next month we do definitely invite you back <laughs> yeah and every time the universe gives us something different to yes. talk about <laughs> very kind in that way okay well thank you very much everybody and uh thank you everybody for joining and thank you jamika for for guiding us as always i was so there's a chat, there's a comment that I want to read out to make sure the people in the control room hear it. And it says, thanks. I was surprised to see that the control room looked like it was straight out of the movies. <laughs> it's so pretty you, impressive. Right? You guys are the real stars movie around stars. here. Like, oh. You guys actually made a movie out of that, right? Like, uh, in, in progress. In in progress. Like, okay. <laughs> I was a telescope operator. Oh, that's right. Yeah, right yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah. And Zach was the astronomer. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, yes. Super funny. Okay. Yeah, nice. And thanks, Mark. Thanks, Denise, for allowing us to shadow you. Oh, you're welcome. Mahalo nui loa. Thank you all so much for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you in a future Shadow the Scientist session. Aloha. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Bye. See you next time. Bye.